of your music for sharing that with us this morning. You know, I, I picked the scripture from Isaiah 40 before I knew that Jean Krell was being placed into hospice care. And certainly before I knew what this Sunday would hold, but God is good because the words of this scripture, they touched me this morning. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. God will gather us and carry us and comfort us. And it's impossible for me to stand here and, and not look just straight ahead to the pew where Mr. Krell would always sit. And so as we all remember him this morning, I think of how he has joined our great cloud of witnesses. Will you pray with me? Comfort, oh comfort your people, oh God. And this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and shepherd and redeemer. Amen. Do you ever wonder about John? John the baptizer? John the relative of Jesus? John the wild prophet? I wonder about him. Everything that we are told in the scriptures makes me want to know more. His dress, he wears garments of camel's fur, a style that was out of date even for his time and sounds really itchy. His diet, he eats locusts and honey. I can never quite decide if that sounds like a delicious snack, sort of sweet and crunchy at the same time, or like a deeply unpleasant meal. His practice of baptism, one which brings Jesus to the waters and that shapes our own tradition. It's all so fascinating to me. And then there's John's insistence that he is but a herald. John is very clear in his preaching that he is not the Messiah. He is paving the way for the one who is to come, for Jesus. I mean, can you imagine saying this to a group of followers? People have traveled far and wide to come hear you, and then you tell them that you're not the one that they're looking for. This is certainly not the way of most contemporary figures. It's not a good way to gain followers or donors or press. But John is clear. He is a herald. I believe this demonstrates John's connection to God, his ability to discern God's message. John knows who he is. And John knows who is coming. This is how the Gospel of Mark begins, with a herald. Mark doesn't start with the birth of Jesus, like in the Gospel of Matthew. And Mark doesn't start with the beginning of time, like in the Gospel of John. In fact, Mark doesn't include the nativity story at all. So the scripture we heard this morning is a thoroughly Advent text. It focuses us on the waiting. It focuses us on the preparation for what is to come. Here again, the opening lines. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. 
there are multiple meanings here, multiple beginnings. It's the beginning of this gospel. It's the beginning of the Jesus narrative, but this beginning doesn't come out of nowhere. It's a beginning that's part of a larger story, part of the ongoing story of God and her people. Mark knows something that we too often forget, that our present moment and future path is shaped by what has come before. And because Mark knows this, he starts his gospel by taking us back in time, back to the prophet Isaiah, back to other voices that have cried out in the wilderness. Mark is quoting from a section of the book of Isaiah that Foster read in full for us this morning, Isaiah 40. I've preached several times on Isaiah over the past year, partly because the lectionary told me to, and partly because it's just so relevant to our times. Isaiah prophesies to a people who have been through disaster a people in exile, a people longing for home, for the spaces that are sacred to them. We too have experienced disaster. Let me be more precise. We are sort of in the midst of disaster. Hopelessness abounds. Faith weakens. Our traditions, our ways of connecting with God are not accessible in the way that they were last year. This is what happens in disaster. Disasters make people, make us, numb, afraid, and sometimes even hopeless. They undermine faith in God and in traditions that once presented the world as orderly and secure. Oh, for a world that feels orderly and secure. Disasters unsettle us and they awaken us. They clarify our humanity. As Isaiah puts it, and as we are all far too aware this morning, we are grass that can wither. In disaster, there is no hiding behind false security. We know that we hurt. We know that we make mistakes. We know that we dream. And we know that we die. Disasters, in turn, bring out the best and the worst in us. Isaiah is speaking to people who have, in turn, denied God and relied on God, who have hurt each other and who have helped each other, who are in a wilderness that is part circumstance, part bad luck, and partly of their own making. We can relate to these people, these people who perhaps in previous years felt like two-dimensional characters on a page. But this year, oh, 2020, we have had our humanity laid bare before us. We have hurt and we have helped. We have denied and we have relied. We have at times dug ourselves further into the wilderness, letting more and more people slide into poverty, exhausting and endangering our essential workers. At some points in this year, we have been so full of generous, caring, steadfast spirit. And at other times, we have been cranky and we have been selfish and we have taken things out on our neighbor. We've been in a wilderness. We've been in a wilderness. I feel it. And I think that you do too. 
And perhaps this is why our hearts leap at the sound of these scriptures. We have been in the wilderness, and so we need to hear that defiant voice crying out from the wilderness beside us. We need the herald. So what does this herald say? Both heralds in our text, both Isaiah and John, say that God loves us. God loves us. God forgives us. And perhaps the thing we are most desperate to hear, the disaster will end. It always ends. Every day this week, I lit the candle of hope in my Advent wreath at home. And because of where I sit at my table to do work, the candle is just in the corner of my vision. I can't see it directly unless I, I turn my head, kind of like this one here this morning. But I know that it's there. It was there this week as I sipped my tea and wondered what the day would bring. It was there as I prayed over these texts. It was there when I received the news that Gene Krell was in his final days. And every once in a while it flickered and it drew my attention reminding me each time that there is hope when things feel hopeless, that God is present in the wilderness. This week we add a candle, the candle of peace. Oh, and I crave peace perhaps more than anything right now. Like many of you, I am weary. I want the peace of sitting in the presence of my loved ones. I want the peace of a nation that isn't coming apart at the seams. I want the peace that comes when justice rules the land. But we aren't there yet. We're not there yet, but the voice in the wilderness tells us that it's coming. I'm tempted to stop here to conclude with the knowledge that deep peace and restoration is on its way. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, it's really just the beginning. Because once we hear, we're asked to follow. We've received the news, and so now we have to prepare the way. We have to lift up those valleys and lower the mountains. We have to straighten the path so that all people, I hope you didn't miss that part of the scripture. It says all people can walk into God's presence together. We have to lift our voices and become this great wilderness choir that is proclaiming the advent of our God. I think, I think this is why the Gospel of Mark starts with a herald, with that wild John the Baptist. Mark wants us to remember that this is just the beginning. This is just the start of the good news. Where else can it go, Hyde Park Union Church? Can the good news go to all who are gathered on Zoom? Can the good news go to those who are sick? Can the good news go to those who are grieving? Where else will it take us, church? Will it take us through the streets of our city? Will it take us into deeper, more vulnerable relationships with one another? Will it take us to a new understanding of how to be church? We are commissioned to find out. We are commissioned to become heralds, to be the bearers of hope and peace to all, to be the ones who, even in the midst of this terrible wilderness, say, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God is with us. 
As I stand in our sanctuary this morning, I think of each one of you. And I think of this power that we have. The power we have to become heralds to one another. That is so needed right now. We all need to hear the good news. And one way that we do this when we're in person is by passing the peace. It's a significant moment in our worship, and it's something we haven't really been able to do on Zoom. There's no way to shake hands or give a hug on this platform. So I have a challenge for you this week. I challenge you to be a herald. And there are many ways to do this, but maybe one in particular this week is to pick someone in our community. Maybe someone whose little square you see on the Zoom and give them a call, send them a card, send them an email, tell them that they matter to you and that they matter to God. Pass the peace, herald the good news for Christ Emmanuel is coming. Amen. Amen.